studying the tabernacle. <clears throat> and the, let's see, the chart that we've been using is entitled The Historical and Spiritual Progression of the House of God, or as some would say, the House of God. If you do not have that chart, raise your hand. No, let's put it this way. If you were never given that chart. From, I know the cameras can't follow me, but I'm handing this out to 30, 40 different people. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't take me long. <laughs> All right. And in that chart, the, uh, the top part of the chart is entitled the historical progression of the house of God, and the bottom part is entitled the spiritual progression of the house of God. And notice, even though this is a study of the tabernacle, the Lord instructed me that you can't do a study of the tabernacle without doing a study of the temple or the house of God all through the scriptures. And so... Uh, under the historical thing, we saw Abraham as an individual finding God, offering anywhere he was with God. But then Moses' tabernacle being raised up, and that is the first house of God outside of just being an individual. <clears throat> and then that tabernacle was moved to Shiloh, and on the chart there we have the taking of the ark, which represent well, we'll see that down below shortly. Then David's tabernacle, and now in this class we have finally arrived at Solomon's temple, <clears throat> the permanent and glorious. And the spiritual progression of this is Abraham worshiped God in heaven, that's down below, and then the incarnation of Christ is, is ty uh, typed by Moses' tabernacle. <clears throat> and then the taking of the ark, we saw a picture of the cross. David's tabernacle represents resurrection and Solomon's temple, which we're getting to today, and for the rest of this class, represents the body of Christ, the resurrected body of Christ. <clears throat> and um, we are the body of his resurrection. We are the temple of God. We are the house of God. We've gone over that. <clears throat> we've, we've covered quite a bit. In fact, we're winding down now we'll only have a few more days two or three more times we'll get together <clears throat> um, and so um, we have in this chart on the far right bottom begins speaking of this the body of Christ and <clears throat> Paul begins to bring in the teaching of the body now the church had been going for some time in Jerusalem it had been going for a while and there was no real teaching of the body of Christ at that time. Paul was the main one who introduced the teaching of the body of Christ. And that's why there is this period of time that covers the resurrection that is David's tabernacle. And you, we dealt with that in our last couple of classes, that it dealt with the issue of the law. But, but the main thing that God wanted to bring forth was not David's tabernacle, ultimately, but was... Solomon's temple or which is a shadow the body of Christ that we would be the true temple <clears throat> and so Paul is the one God used to bring in that teaching and, and you find the most uh, vivid teaching in all of his writings and not only that but Paul goes around and he sets up churches he doesn't just win people to the Lord I mean remember Philip won the Ethiopian and different you know this one on one thing but Paul sees this thing as greater than salvation for individuals. He sees the body of Christ as be, being the fulfillment of what God always had in mind concerning the house of God. And that that temple, now remember in, when they were in the Jerusalem church before Paul began to preach and everything, where was the house of God as they understood it? It was Herod's temple. They still went to that temple in worship. Did you know that? You know? And uh, you, you, you know the story, Silver and Gold Have I None? Remember the song? Remember that song? You never heard it, have you? 
um, a lame man sat at the, the gate and, and, uh, of the, the uh, temple, and Peter and John come in, and Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way. He held out a, his palm and asked for an alm, and this is what Peter did say. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He went walking and leaping and praising God. Okay, great story. But it, it's another example of an individual finding healing or salvation or whatever while they're going into Herod's temple as if that represents the resurrected body of Christ. And remember, this all happened in the book of Acts after Jesus' death and resurrection. So the church in Jerusalem did not fully grasp this thing of the body of Christ. And later on, Paul did. And because of that, they tended to minister to individuals. And of course, they, had, they met from house to house and whatever. But they still honored that temple. When Paul began to see Christ and he began to see, you know, because the cross, folks, the cross wasn't just um, uh, Jesus died. He was raised from the dead. And as he was raised, Paul saw on that cross that we died to our old life and we are raised up now to a new life. And that new life is Christ in us. And that we are that temple now. And that was, that was world-shaking reality that he began to see. <clears throat> and so um, uh, Paul doesn't just go around and minister to individuals. He goes into every city and starts setting up churches. And those churches representing part and parcel of the church, the body of Christ. And so with that not, not just with the resurrection, because that wasn't recognized right off the bat as strongly as it was after Paul. The tabernacle of David was primarily in, in spirit. The, the true meaning of that was recognized, but not Solomon's temple. <clears throat> and so in, the resur in, in Paul's understanding of the resurrection, the fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament represented concerning house of God, whether it was Moses' tabernacle or David's tabernacle or Solomon's temple, all that God ever meant and planned was happening right there in us. Not with us, but in us. Christ in us. And we living now, not as just, um, <clears throat> well, the way the Jews lived, going to temple. No. We are the temple. Do you see? That? I mean, huge difference. I mean, you know, they, and of course they honored the temple and you get the whole story from Jeremiah and all that where they began to hold to that and God took the, that temple away from them. And God will take everything away from us that is shadows to bring us to the true, okay? And the true is we don't go to anything. We are that. We're meant to be that. And we're, we're, we are, um, it, Paul calls it a revelation and one of the mysteries. And it's still a mystery to the churches today. Even though they call themselves the body of Christ, the temple, they're not letting him inhabit them in the sense of living his life in them. And so, uh, just to sort of kick this off, I want us to go to Psalms 15. <clears throat> and just to look at a, <clears throat> a, uh, one verse here. <clears throat> I was looking at this, uh, <clears throat> this, this psalm. And... <clears throat> um, just the uh, reality of what the Lord is saying in this very first verse, Psalm 1, I mean Psalm 15, verse 1. <clears throat> Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Well, just right there. That's enough. Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? And as I meditated on that, 
I realized that way that it is said is so Old Testament, so translated King James. I want you to think of the meaning of that. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? And as I meditated on it, the Lord translated it for me. Who shall live in God's tent? Who shall live in God's tent? Who's going to live in there? God is, folks. You ain't supposed to be living in there. I mean, you know, I mean, it's the way that you read it, you kind of, but that's really what he's asking. And that is the question today, even particularly today, more so than even when David wrote this is, who's going to live in God's temple? Who's going to live in God's house? And so to follow that up, let's go to uh, Song of Solomon. <clears throat> It just wouldn't be right to have Geraldine here and not go to the Song of Solomon. I'm just, you know. And here in uh, Song of Solomon, we have another presentation of who shall abide in God's house, who will live in God's tent, who will live in God's temple, who, you know. Again, that's a question. That's a question. You have to answer that. You're God's temple. You have to answer that. Who's going? Is it going to be me or is it going to be him? And so Song of Solomon, chapter 5, did I tell you that? <clears throat> and starting with uh, verse um, <clears throat> 2. Yeah, thank you, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with, with drops of the night. And the bride says, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put his hand to the latch of the door, and my heart was moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. <clears throat> and um, so here we find the story where the king comes, uh, the the. The one who owns the house, if you will, <clears throat> and you know you can can draw that any number of ways. Is this this thing working? Okay. Good job, guys. Um, you can draw it as you know. Here is the uh, body and the inhabitor is instead of it being him, it's her. So we're just going to go ahead and draw this with a, <clears throat> a square representing her. And he is outside, and he comes to his habitation, and he knocks, and he tries to get in, and she's in there. And she's all comfortable, and she's, you know, inhabiting, and she's really enjoying his habitation. You understand? Okay, well, her, if you, if you, you know, let's make sure that we understand that the, the circle represents her body and the square represents her being as the inhabitor. Do you understand? That'd be you in there. <laughs> I got it. If Mike can get it, anybody can get it, folks. <laughs> Just kidding. But, uh, you know, that, that, and she's living in there, and she's doing it in a really righteous, glorious way because she's living in there for, remember, this represents Christ. She's living in there for his glory. She's living for his glory through this temple. And she believes that that's exactly what he wants. 
to live in your body and to live for his glory and to get cleaned up and to get, you know, not just cleaned up, but, but smelling better than you were when you were an old, un, you know, defiled, when you were a defiled person, you know. So there's been a real improvement in you. But you see, his understanding is that you are his temple, not just somebody, not just a person trying to bring him glory with your temple, but that he is the inhabitor. And so he comes and he finds that she's there and that she's made herself at home and she's made herself comfortable. And so he goes away, and of course he, he, he will continue to relate to us whatever way that will allow him to do that. But folks, from start to finish, when you start all the way back on the timeline, back here, if you, if you go to Moses' tabernacle, you start all the way back there and you go all the way down to Solomon's temple, With all of that, with everything that happens along there, every ounce of it was supposed to be pointing them to the one glorious reality when they hid it, the body of Christ in resurrection where Christ inhabits his temple in reality, in a real way. Not just in some cold building called Solomon's temple, not just in some sheeted building called Moses' tabernacle, but inside of us to be able to live in that way. David asked it, you know, who shall live in God's tent? <laughs> Who's going to be living in there? You know, it's probably God through him, don't you think? Who, you make the decision. You make the decision. Don't, when, you know, and, and uh, I think uh, during the, the uh, conference, I think, Geraldine, you made reference to Jesus, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I think you did. Pretty sure you might have. But anyway, <clears throat> you know the scripture. It's in the book of Revelation. And when, that, when that, those letters in the book of Revelation start being written, it starts off with Jesus in the midst of the seven churches. You remember that? How many got three of you? Perfect. And Jesus is in the midst. And seven represents completion. So that's that, those churches were not seven special churches. They were seven. They weren't seven specific names, although the names are mentioned. They were seven representing the whole complete body of Christ and Jesus is found in the midst. But with time, as it begins to proceed and goes from one to the other, he ends up outside there and he's no longer inside. And what is he doing? He's knocking to get in. He's trying to get back in. You read it. It's right there in the book of Revelation. And so... Um, so there is this reality because this, it is the churches. It's the church of Sardis and the church of per Pergamos and all of the different ones. It's the church, but he's ended up outside again. And he's trying to get in just like in the Song of Solomon. But he's not just trying, you know, there's, di there's different ways to interpret different actions in the Song of Solomon or in any book, right? You know, we can say, oh, he's trying to get in there to his beloved bride because he wants to, he really has an urge to snuggle. <laughs> Fat chance, he's a dude. <laughs> I'm joking. I snuggle, don't I? But, uh, but we 
slide back, we backslide, we slip back into this place where we become the inhabitor, where we want God to bless us. We don't mind him being out there because we place him out there in our theology and our doctrine, and he's out there to bless us. Now you tell me if that isn't the basic teaching of the modern day church today, that Jesus exists outside of us and he's out there to bless us. And yes, there's probably not a Christian alive that wouldn't say I got Jesus in me. But if you said, is he living in you and you're dead so that you know it's him? And they would go, ah, what sort of heres heretic teaching is that? My God. You know, you say, well, that's that, that heretic Paul. Because <laughs> he's the one who began to see the the church as the body of Christ and as the temple of God and that the, the whole history of Israel, the whole history of his, his um, culture and nation from start to finish when they came out, because they weren't a nation until they came out of Egypt. And they came out as a nation and God almost immediately begins to introduce them to the tabernacle. So it's his whole ingrained history, and he sees it for the first time in living color, in reality, the way God meant it, and that wasn't it. And everything along that timeline wasn't it. It was pointing to it, and he's looking at the church, and he's going, oh, my God, we are it. We're what he was, God always wanted. So he began to share that. But in the book of Revelation, now remember, it's already passing time. Paul may already be dead by then. And people are already putting him back out there. And, and, you know, we'd say we'd never do that. But, folks, the common way that we think, do we automatically look to Jesus for help, like, up? Or do we go, you know... I need peace. Reign in me as the prince of peace. Reign in your temple. Because you know the temple was also the king's palace. Yeah. The throne he sat on was a throne of grace, but it was also an ascension throne. Am I right or wrong? Well, what was that throne? It was the mercy seat. It was in the temple. It wasn't, you know, somewhere else. He, he didn't go... He didn't have a little secret palace, Jesus didn't, when he rose from the dead. Do you understand what I'm saying? The, that as priest and king, he sat down in the same place. And there's a big, law, there's a really intricate search on this, and I've done it. And I, you know, I, I'd hope when we first got into Tabernacle this time, I'd get a chance to really get into it. But it, it's really intricate and then drawn out and I just I decided we're not going to do it but I'm telling you that there is a really reality there are so many scriptures that relate the king to the high priest and them sitting on the same throne because they're the same person because it's the same place it's not a king's palace and a temple for worship you understand religious it is my body and that's the way he always so, so if he wants to, if he wanted to, if he wanted to sit in a palace, we would be that palace, and he wants to rule in us. Do you get it? If he wants to be a high priest, he wants to be in the temple, us, and fulfill those things within us. All right. So, um, you, so you have this thing where you know we're working on our own righteousness. We're working on our own situation. And yes, part of that problem may be that we're, we're uh, focusing more on us and therefore we didn't answer the door. Okay, I'm not, I'm not taking that away from anybody, but I got news for you. We're supposed to be the temple. He doesn't want to just come in 
and have us just like the bride heart all focused on him. He wants us to exist also, not just as a bride, but as a body. Do you know that the scriptures talk about your bride, your wife, as your body? Did you know that? Well, that, why would it do that? Because it's the same thing to him. There is no separation. You don't go, oh, I got a bride heart, but you go live somewhere else. Or you, or you know what I mean. Uh, or we'd say, I have a bride heart, come live with me. No. You are also my temple, my body. And I want to live in there. The bride heart is going to be related to allowing him to come in and find us as a habitation. You see how that, you can't get around that part. Now, and again, I'm not taking away anything else that you've learned and heard from God and seen in the vast waves of Song of Solomon done. <laughs> Song of Solomon done. <clears throat> but... <laughs> But this is still the truth, also. And, uh, <clears throat> and so, uh, uh, and you, you know, the biggest picture, too, that you get, I mean, this is a, the Song of Solomon is a great little story of him and the king and his wife. And, and who's the king there? Solomon. But the bigger story of Solomon is this temple he built, the thing that filled all of history and that was the most glorious reality was this temple which is only a shadow because the most glorious reality is when we have that heart for the Lord enough to say, I would rather you live than me. I would rather just, I want to be your vessel. And, and when you say that, of course, you're not, you know. It's, it's hard to describe because it is Christ in us. It's Christ in us. Us. So every ounce of you is not wiped out. Your personality is there. Your way and things that God has put within you uh, to make you you is there. But the life and the nature and the spirit in which you perceive is the living God himself. Your husband who lives in you, not for you. I don't want to belabor that. Let me make sure I've got everything here. <clears throat> um, so I'll just read a paragraph or two. We find a story in Song of Solomon 5. The king comes home to what should have been his habitation and finds that its purpose has been changed. That's significant, folks. We go around changing God's purposes and then saying this is his purpose when it never was his purpose. We change that. His bride is functioning as if it's her habitation, this body. Her focus was more on personal righteousness and getting everything cleaned up so she could be clean and dwell safely. The Shulamite focused on how the church, um, on how the church related to her, what she sees the purpose for the church. And so we, we say, well, the church, the purpose for the church is so I'll have a family. You, you sort of getting what I'm talking about here? So, I, well, we're in this church. We could just live as individual Christians, but we're in this church so that we'll have a family and dwell safely and have accountability, get cleaned up, smell better. You follow in Song of Solomon. <laughs> and, and all of those things... And we're, we, while, and in some cases, people haven't changed the purpose. They've just changed the person to whom it is focused upon. So Paul, in Galatians 4.19, we don't have to turn there, travailed till Christ was formed in the church. Does that seem significant at all in light of what we're talking about? That he is groaning deeply in prayer because he sees the Galatian churches because Galatia was an area full of different believers and stuff that the, the Galatians were, were serving God without Christ formed in them again trying to 
bring glory to God. And I'm telling you, the only glory God's going to get is Christ in you. That's his hope of glory, not just yours. You know, God has a hope. He hopes to get Jesus out of you. <laughs> you know, I hope so. You know. <clears throat> and um, so Paul, who was the guy who originally God used to expound and to release the seeds of this reality that we're the temple of God, we're the body of Christ to the rest of them. He now sees that even those to whom he has preached are getting off and he is travailing in prayer that Christ would be formed in them. And if you look at it, it's, I think it, the actual words is that, uh, that Christ be formed in you again, basically, you know, because they have, ser they have moved to serving a God who is no longer formed in them. He is formed in their mind. He is formed in their theology. He's formed in heaven at the right hand of God. But Paul is not praying for any of that. He's not praying for miracles. He's not praying for a better situation for the Galatians. He's not praying that uh, <clears throat> the Romans would back off. He's not praying that the churches would uh, get along. He's not praying that there would be revival. He's praying for Christ to be formed in people. My God, somebody. I wish J.W. was here. <laughs> All right, so David also had so focused on himself. He was focused on himself, defeating the enemy, getting peace. Let's see. I think I've got that in a scripture. Let's go to 2 Samuel and see if I'm... Got the right verse here, Second Samuel 7. All right, this is pretty powerful stuff right here. Second Samuel 7, verse 1, says this. And it came to pass, now notice... Anytime it says, and it came to pass, folks, that means that there was something God had in mind, and it finally was brought into view. It finally was brought into something. It finally began to come to pass an uh, aspect that they did not have up to that point, okay? And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies that... The king said unto Nathan, the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, and the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And so uh, here he had all of this time he'd been king, hadn't he? But where was his focus? His focus was with God, though, right? Right? I mean, David knew God. Do you agree with that? But folks... His focus was that God be with him while he defeats his enemies, while he comes to peace, just like the Shulamite, defeat my enemies, bring me to peace, clean me up, make me happy. And he's got a purpose beyond that. And so he goes away. If we're not open to it, come back someday when we're open to it. And uh, so let me just read this. And David also had so focused on himself and on defeating the enemy and getting peace, but now wanted to present something to God that would truly honor him, something that, that was what he really desired all along. Well, he never, he never had time to fully grasp this because only when rest starts coming... Do you start looking away from yourself and looking to the things of God and the heart of God? Until that comes, trust me, you can try not to, but <laughs> you, you'll, you'll try to focus on his heart and you'll immediately, you know, I mean, you can be in prayer and go, oh, Lord, I just want your heart and everything, and then start thinking of some problems or this and that. And, you know, your mind wander. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, and you're just kind of going... Good grief, what is wrong with me? I'm, I mean, I've done that a million times, you know. <clears throat> and uh, so um, the God who had given David everything 
and delivered him from so much was not dwelling in the grand house, a body that rightly and gloriously reflects him. He was not dwelling in a grand house that he deserved. A body that rightly and gloriously reflects him. Okay? Now David is, is in a position to see this for the first time. And you got to remember, man, you talk about strides. This, this David guy was nothing but Mr. Striding with God. He was, you know, from the very first little shepherd boy, he's with God. He's with God all the way through. He's with God in the caves. He's with God for seven years. He's with God when they make him king. He sets up David's tabernacle. I mean, that was of God, and it was, it was beyond everything. Anything that any priest or anybody could imagine because it wasn't Moses' tabernacle. It was a departure. It was separating the Holy of Holies from the rest of the law parts, the sacrifice for sin and all of the thing get cleaned up. And, and it totally just brought the Holy of Holies near so that he could enter in and be with the Lord even though he wasn't of the tribe of Levi. He, in, in one sense, he broke the law in a million ways, but in another sense, he never broke the law because he saw what we usually don't see. We see the established order, and we go, no, no, that's the, not the way it should be done. David saw the heart of the Lord, okay? So he sees the heart of the Lord, and he sets up David's tabernacle along about right in here on the timeline, and, and it's so glorious, and it's so beautiful, and he sets up worshipers inside of there, and people just come in, and they're going, we're in the Holy of Holies, you know? And it was just a gloriously beautiful reality. But now David's sitting in his house, and he's got rest round about. God has delivered him. God has, has used him mightily. And he's sitting there. And he's thinking about the Lord. And he goes, oh. Oh, man. I thought, I thought that tabernacle right out there was it. I thought that was the big breakthrough. And it was, but it wasn't the big breakthrough. Does that make sense? It was such a departure, and yet it was such a revelation, and yet it wasn't all of it. You would think that the next generation or the next one or 10 years or 20 years or 100 years or 200 years, somebody down the road would go, you know, this, this David's Tabernacle thing ain't what it's about. But no, the same man who, who had worshipped in Moses' Tabernacle set up David's Tabernacle now conceived in his heart what was in the heart of God all along. The, the thing, the end to which all this was pointing. A temple that, what was the wording that I used? A body, a temple that rightly and gloriously reflects him. That, and, that allow, yes, make sure I say this right. That allows him, that allows him to live in them. And them not to live. Everybody allows Jesus to live in them. You know, what, I don't know what he's doing in there. I'm sure he's living in there. But I'm pretty much running the, the household. Arm moved. Eyes, brain, think. You know what I mean? Feet, take me. So and so, take me. See, you're not, you're not a holy temple separated unto the Lord. Just like it was meant to be. From Moses' tabernacle on through where this is your place. This is not our place. And you take, you hear this all the time, you take control. But what we mean is we look up to heaven and say, no, you take control. You know, it's like, you know, giving a teenager your car, they go out, they're in the, mark, the parking lot of the mall hitting 50 cars, you know, and you come pulling up because he called and said, oh, oh my God, it's getting bad in there, and you, you know, take control, and they move over and let you in. Folks, Jesus doesn't want you to move over. He wants you to move up on the cross. Well, we're moving on up to the cross. 
there, 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 you fulfill half of the plan of God, and that half is you die, and then he's the life. But folks, and I'll get into all that here pretty quick, there has to be a dedication to that proposition. That all men are created dead. That's an American thing I'm quoting from. But you know, that that's the proposition that God has for us. Life out of death, but he's the life. Death, we embrace that so that he can what? Live. Isn't that what Paul says? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But I embrace the doctrine that I'm dead so that I can still live. Isn't that exactly what he said? No. <laughs> he says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I. Christ lives in me. And he's saying the reason why I embrace this death is that I may be a true, get ready, temple. That I may really be one, not a theological one. Oh, we're all the temple of God. Are you? I mean, are you now? Or is it, or is it God's temple and you're living in it? Remember our scripture? Who shall live in God's tent? Who's going to live in God's temple? David asked that. God asked that. And so, um, well, let me make sure I got all this done here the lord the the god who had given the god who had given david everything and delivered him from so much was not dwelling in a body in a temple that rightly and gloriously reflected him david was no longer content that he was blessed with a great house while god was relegated to a tent in the backyard can you see something hit this guy? This guy really had a heart after God. Something hit this guy, and he's going, you know what? This isn't it. I really thought it was it. I thought I knew so much. So much. I mean, you know, nobody else saw this David's tabernacle thing. Nobody else saw this Holy of Holies. And I camped around it, and I made it everything. And I didn't, be I didn't consider that he had more in mind than that my stopping at this point was stopping him from getting all that he ever desired, even though I claimed to be the guy after God's heart. What's wrong with me? <laughs> and he wasn't happy with it. He wasn't happy with it. We have been blessed by God. Uh, with David, all this came about at a time when God had given him rest from his enemies. His focus was no longer on himself and struggling with the enemy. Okay? All right. Well, that makes sense. You know, I mean, sadly, but it does make sense that as long as we're still struggling and trying to get out of the grasp of the enemy and everything... We'll never be able to really, really hear the heart of God. We have to get to a place where we begin to enter into rest that God has provided. And there we will see the true, and see all of this pattern was there. You begin to see the true heart and purpose of God and what he intended all along. So God says to David, you're not, you're not going to build this temple. My son, the son of David, is going to build it. Jesus, thou um, son of Sol uh, Solomon. Jesus, thou son of David. Didn't he call him that? Jesus, thou son of David. The one who will build the temple. But David got alone with God and got the pattern. He heard everything, and then he spent all of his time gathering the parts from afar and near to bring this thing together. Because it was so in his heart that God had a temple. Well, folks, that's what we should be doing. 
We should be, if, if, we're, if God won't let you build something, if, you know, I really want to serve God. And, you know, usually in our mind, it's like, I want to serve God. I want to build a great big ministry where he's so glorified and I'm famous <laughs> or rich, <laughs> which are both. And, um, and so he won't let you do it. I don't know why God limits me. I don't know why God holds me back. I don't know why life is so, you know, it's like when I take one step forward and God makes me move two steps back. It ain't the devil. I figured this out. God's doing this. You know, the devil isn't, isn't smart enough to do all this. <clears throat> well, maybe he's wanting you to dedicate yourself to the building of the temple without building it, but hearing from God, giving that that blueprint to others who will build it, um, uh, providing whatever. You, you, under, you understand what I'm talking about. I mean, it's, a, it's dedicated to this proposition. God wants and deserves a temple, and that's what he sought all along. <clears throat> all right, us, us, right here. I mean, the church, the church. You know, it's not, we don't have to... Go look for a ministry, folks. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get around to uh, to building the temple or not because I'm trying to cover so much here. But in the New Testament, it's talked about quite a bit, especially by Paul, of what truly building the temple like they did in Hez uh, uh, Ezra. Truly building the temple is, and it's spelled out in good old-fashioned practical stuff. I love it. I love it. All right. Let me change gears because what do we got? How many? Five minutes? Yeah. No. All right. So because we're really, really readily running out of time, uh, let's go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 20. John 4 and verse 20, our fathers, uh, this is the uh, Samaritan woman, not to be confused with the Shulamite woman. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Uh, Ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. All right. So we are the church, and our primary identification concerning us being the church is not bound up with a location. It's not about a location. That's what Jesus said. She says, well, you say and not they say. He went, let me tell you, it has nothing to do with that. It's, it's in that sense, um, it's neither because it's not where we gather but why we gather that's important to him. Because a lot of people gather in some pretty beautiful places and there's some pretty beautiful churches and all this kind of stuff and great cities in which all this stuff is. But we gather to be living stones to make up his temple so that Christ will live in all of us. And we're not satisfied with just being an individual rock. We're living stones part of the temple. You know, that's why people walk around going, I rock. But God doesn't want you to rock. He wants you to stone. He wants you to be a living stone, okay? And uh, let's go to one of, one of the best scriptures on this. And I quoted it recently, but it's over in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew 16. <clears throat> and we'll just read the last part of verse 18. 
I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The most important part of that verse isn't that the gates of hell will not prevail, folks. But that's what they, oh, praise God, the devil ain't going to, you know, the devil won't be able to get through, you know. The most important part is Jesus is building his church. He's building his church. And, um, but, you know, and he's building his church, but to what end? That's the question. Jesus is building his church to become his temple, his house, his habitation. That's, okay? So, let's see. Oh, makes me want to jump way down here. All right. Let's go to Ephesians 2. I'm try, I, I really want to jump ahead, but it's not time yet. Ephesians 2, verse 21 and 22. Ephesians 2, verse 21 and 22, says this. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. All right? So there, notice the word building. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth. There is a process going on where we are supposed to be involved with God in separating ourselves unto his purpose of being a temple in the Lord. That requires more than just being a Christian and more than just letting Christ live in you. It is coming together with this intended purpose that Christ inhabit us, not just me, or you, or you understand what I'm saying, us, as the temple of God, okay? Um, so I wrote, what is the church? It is the house of God. What is a proper definition of the church? It is that God relegates all its, all its faculty and being to making itself less so that Christ may be the one living within we should be working with all that we have to decrease so that Christ can live within. It is dedicated, the church is dedicated to becoming a house of God. Whatever things we may be involved with as Christians that are with as Christians that are not building us together, My wording's messed up here. Unless those things have the direct purpose of building us together as a habitation of God. We are the temple of God. The church is present when we are being built together for one purpose of being made as a habitation for the life of Christ. Anything built apart from having that purpose, meaning building people together as a church. We're a church. We're going to come together and world evangelization is going to be our purpose. So... Uh, any, anything built apart from having that purpose misses the true purpose, and there is no being built together apart from this purpose. No, there's not. I mean, I'm, that's not Randy's statement. That's the Bible. You have to check that out. See, that's why you have one of these things. You have to make sure that I'm not feeding you a bunch of bull. No, you do. You have to search the scriptures. And, uh, you know, I challenge you. Prove me wrong. But you see, if I'm making statements that are from God, they're not my statements. So you're going to have a hard time proving, you know, God wrong. Because there is no speaking in terms in the New Testament of building us together except for one purpose, that Christ may live his life in us. And that's it. That's it. All, the, all else and all the things that we're involved with that we call Building up the church is not doing it. Let me see if I can get in. How much time we got? All right, let's go to uh, 1 Peter 2. First Peter chapter 2. And 
and verse 5. <clears throat> We're just going to read the first half of this one too so that we can keep our focus. 1 Peter 2, 5. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house. Okay, right there. You, as living stones, are being built up as a house. You're not being built up as a Christian, like, like what we think. He's building us up as a house, a habitation of God. So, all right, so here we go. Is the term living stones, okay, just use that term. Is the term living stones just another term for being Christian? I got one, I got two no's. Hey, better, 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 I got two, got two, got two, do I have three? Okay. No, it's not. Um, we may identify a Christian by the fact that he goes to services each week, reads his Bible, prays, etc. right? Oh, he's a Christian, look. He carries a Bible. He's praying right now, he's going to church. But how do we determine if someone is a living stone? 1 Peter 2, 5 helps us. They are not just living as individual stones, but are being built up as a spiritual house. They have joined with others who have set their purpose to become a habitation of God. That's how you identify a living stone. <clears throat> Jesus builds his church through revelation, right? We, re you know, we didn't get into all that, but it was in uh, revelation, uh, Matthew 16. Um, what revelation? the revelation of himself, but not just as a person, but as the life and rightful inhabitor of us. The work of the Holy Spirit is to reveal the Son in his body, the church. We are the temple of God, a habitation for himself, and this church grows to the degree that Christ is expanded within us. Amen? All right. All right, also on in here, let's read, uh, since we're right here, 1 Peter 2, uh, 4 through 8. <clears throat> to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore who believe he is precious, he who? This cornerstone of the house. Um, Unto them who are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Every ounce of this is talking about the house and being a habitation of God. Do you see that? It's not just talking about being a believer. And uh, verse 8, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them who stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Well, what is the disobedience, folks? It is not being a living stone and living towards that end of providing God a habitation. So I'm going to try to go through this real quick. Um, the Lord is not just desiring to have us as his house in which to live. In other words, he's not just the inhabitor of the house, but is also the thing upon which we are to be built, the foundation. We could say that Jesus is not just building the church, uh, for that would make the church something separate from him. But he's part of this house, as well as the inhabitor. He's both. The church is built upon Christ as the foundation. He is part of it, and all rests on him, and not just on his building ability. The foundation of this church is Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. God's purpose in saving us was not just that we become living stones with all, all the uh, attention given to us. The purpose and reason God raised Jesus from the dead was so that he might have the preeminence in all things. Colossians 1, 12 through 19. And it says there that he might have the preeminence in all things. <laughs> That's why he was raised from the dead, so that he would have the preeminence in all things. Jesus was, well, I've just said it. Jesus was raised from the dead so that he might have first place in everything. Colossians 1.18. That's it. I got through this little section. Go snack and take a break. <laughs>